Hi, everybody, and welcome to this lunch seminar at Go to 10. Go to 10, for those of you who might not know, is a free event and meeting space, workspace run by the Swedish Internet Foundation. And today we have an incredible lunch seminar with Johan Ragnar from the law firm Sync about how you as an entrepreneur, what you should think about when starting a business, what legal aspects you should think about. So with that said, welcome to the stage, Juan. Thank you very much, Alicia. And welcome, everyone. Uh, Juan Ragnar is my name. And as, uh, as you heard, I come from the law firm Sync. Um, and I will begin with telling you a little about uh, Sync. This is our main office up in uh, Stockholm. I am based in Skåne. So uh, if you are watching this and com coming from Skåne, then you can visit me in uh, Helsingborg. Otherwise, you're very welcome to our Stockholm office at the Birgerjalsgatan. Uh, this is me in summary. This is me in my life. Uh, I'm just going to leave it to you to guess my interests and my, uh, my family. Um, the picture down there with the, the golden club is, is not symbolizing a judge. It's more my interest for auction sites, uh, looking for different exciting objects to purchase and sell. So, Sync is a business-oriented law firm with innovation and tech at our hearts. Uh, so we focus mainly on businesses which are active within tech and innovation. Uh, and you might ask, is there any company today not focusing on innovation and tech? Well, uh, yes, of course, you have real property uh, as one example, or uh, shipping, that's another one. However, innovation and tech is, is, is uh, present in basically all businesses today. So we feel that when we founded Zinc eight years ago, uh, this is the future, and it turned out to be right. So, uh, this is our team. Uh, we're about 35 lawyers. Uh, just last month, we have recruited another seven. So, we see that it's a, it's a high demand for our services, which is, of course, uh, very satisfying. Uh, some of, most of us are generalists to some extent, but perhaps more specialists. So we, we specialize in uh, each in, in different uh, fields of law. If you've ever seen a law book, I, I think that you understand that it's impossible to know everything. You have to specialize in some way. We do only business law. So it's no family law or criminal law or anything like that. And we don't handle tax matters. Uh, then we have friends that we can talk to instead. These are our values. Transparency, curiosity, harmony, and my favorite, friendly. Uh, we have the ambition to be a more soft law firm. Um, and I, we have succeeded in that. Uh, we, we want to be your partner from start to exit and beyond. And we can follow you through the whole corporate journey, assisting you with legal matters. Mygon is our uh, associated company for legal tech. So we have, uh, for example, AI-based uh, agreement review. You can upload, for example, your pers uh, personal data protection policy. And within a minute, you get a markup uh, through AI technology uh, showing uh, the matters for improvement in, in the agreement, which is quite cool. You can also do this with a non-disclosure agreement or end user license agreement and a number of other standardized agreements. Uh, we have just recently signed uh, Shell, or not we, but Mygon has signed Shell as a customer. We made that public today, uh, about to review somewhere around 30,000 agreements 
through the use of AI technology. And just imagine what would happen if, uh, if this would be done manually by, by lawyers in, in terms of time and cost and so on. It would probably be impossible. So today's subject, uh, business law for uh, startups or uh, early companies, uh, scale-ups as well. And I'm going to walk through uh, a number of fields, just on a very high level, just to make you conscious about what legal issues there might be and how you can uh, manage these. So, I mean, for, for more in-depth counselling, you're very welcome to, to contact me or my colleagues. So we start with financing, because uh, you need money to, to run a company. And by that, uh, there are different kinds of money, so to say. You have the cash, uh, you need some liquidity to pay salaries if you have employees. Uh, perhaps you're sitting somewhere uh, in co-working space or other um, facilities where you pay your rent. R&D, uh, which is, uh, could be paid by cash or also uh, be an investment and an asset. And then you have your suppliers of uh, materials, computers, and so on. Other assets might be uh, marketing or consultancy fees uh, or other assets that are you know, useful in your venture. Um, then if we look at the liability side and equity, uh, the equity is basically, to put it simply, your shares. Uh, you can, uh, as I'm sure you can do, do a share issue and take in external uh, investors. However, that comes for the price of dilution, meaning that uh, you, you're losing your influence over the company uh, as, as you do these uh, capital rounds. So even though it's fun to get a lot of capital, you need to think about that, that this dilution effect will happen. Um, the debt is simply you go to the bank and you loan, you borrow money. However, that is at of the price of interest. And being a startup, uh, there it's associated with high risk. High risk is high interest. So you need to um, manage that. Um, this is better used for investments rather than running costs. Because on investments, you expect something to come back. However, with the costs, they uh, disappear in a black hole, <laughs> so to speak. For example, rent. So, um, coming to the legal side, uh, cash is not uh, associated with a lot of legal. I mean, you get money and you pay. Uh, other assets could be consultancy agreements, marketing, uh, your... Um, and other assets. When it comes to equity, we can help with the share issue because that's associated with a lot of documentation usually and you need to register with the company's registration office. Uh, and the debt would be a loan agreement. Uh, if you go to the bank, they usually just have a standard loan agreement. Uh, take it or leave it, it's non-negotiable. If you borrow from a private uh, lender, then it could be more negotiable and we could help you with drafting and negotiating such agreement. These are a couple of key concerns. Uh, I've already spoken about some of them. Uh, the cost comes with interest or dilution. Uh, you should think about the control. Uh, how much influence do you want over your business? Again, there is a, a built-in problem for the investor because the more they invest the more diluted the entrepreneur becomes and the more diluted you are at least in theory the less engaged you are in your company because suddenly you're left with 12 percent and then what's in it for me uh, you also have the founder lock-in uh, meaning that you are obliged to stay with the company uh, you also have uh, usually a clause for non-competition, stating perhaps that for 12 months you're not allowed to do the same thing as you did before. And if that is the only thing that you know, 
then what are you going to do? Uh, employed or consultant or such. Uh, you can also gain a lot of competence through taking in external companies, uh, capital, uh, such as uh, strategic partners. Uh, you perhaps get a board uh, where they have a lot of competence. It's not unusual that we as lawyers get the question if you would like to sit on the board, um, which we sometimes say yes to, sometimes we say no. Um, I'm currently on uh, uh, three boards three different boards, um, all client companies. Um, and also think about the complexity. Is it worth it to put all this money and uh, effort into uh, the investment process? Because it's, it, money doesn't come for free, if you say so. Uh, so this is the, like the legal process of uh, taking in capital. First you have the preparations, uh, that's, uh, then you have the negotiations, uh, you have a term sheet regulating, it's non-binding, uh, but regulating the terms for the upcoming investment. So you sort of sketch uh, how the investment is going to be completed. Then you sign this uh, and the investor typically make a, a makes a due diligence of the company and the owners and so watch. So sort of a health check of the company. Uh, and after that, the final docs, the uh, investment agreements are, and the sh perhaps the shareholders agreements are signed and executed. So we have the preliminary phase, then we have the non-exclusive phase, uh, which means that uh, at this stage, you're allowed to negotiate with different parties. Then you go into the diligence phase, which is exclusive, and then at, le uh, at last you have the, the legally binding execution phase. Now here are some key terms of the term sheet, um, t uh, which are then transferred into the, the final agreement. Valuation of the company is always interesting. How do you value a company that has been active for six or 12 months with a product under development and uh, three founders, uh, no customers, and so on? Uh, there are a, a lot of different methods to value a, a startup. Uh, some just say that all startups are worth 20 million kroner, but uh, <laughs> I, I doubt that is true, uh, depending a lot on the, on the external factors. So usually you take a, um, perhaps an accountant or, uh, that can value the company from a, 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 a good perspective. We talked about the lock-in. How, how, long, for how long are the founders or existing shareholders supposed to stay with the company? The non-compete, I mentioned that. Uh, transferability of shares, you don't want, usually you don't want the shares to be freely transferable because then you can get anyone as a shareholder in the company. So what you usually have is a, a, first of right, uh, a right of first ref refusal where pr before you can sell your shares to anyone, you need to ask the existing owners if they want to uh, purchase the shares. And moving on to another subject, intellectual property. This is a good picture. I found it on uh, Patent och Registreringsverket, where you have, because there, there are different kinds of intellectual property, and in this case, a shoe. You have the trademark here, Pro Solution. Could be Nike, could be Adidas or anything. This is the registered name where you, under which you market your products. You have the design that can be protected. So in this case, the design of this shoe, because it's, uh, if it's unique enough, then you can uh, protect it. Um, I'm thinking about perhaps uh, Hövding, the inflatable helmet. That's a 
pretty unique design. It's also uh, there's also patent involved. A patent is a innovation that is unique enough to obtain protection. So it's not you. You're not allowed to copy it. Uh, yep. Uh, it could be both, actually. Uh, so Nike is a trademark, but Nike Air is a, the product. That's also a trademark. The question was whether a trademark could be uh, both the brand and the name of the product. Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola Zero. That's another example. So. Uh, and then you have the copyright, which is not perhaps relevant for the shoe here. Uh, but uh, if you write a book, it cannot be copied. If you if you paint a picture, uh, you can't copy that without infringing on the artist's copyright. Uh, this is interesting. Intellectual property. Uh, represents nearly 70% of corporate assets of the stock exchange. So this has changed a lot. I mean, it used to be matches and steel and forest and real property and such, but now it's more of intellectual property. And there are a number of tools. Uh, I've never mentioned some of these in, in connection with the shoe. Uh, you have the copyright, uh, the trademarks, design, uh, also contracts. Confidentiality could be, I mean, the contract is you enter into an agreement with someone that you're not allowed to use uh, the products. The non-competition clause could be such uh, because you're not allowed to use uh, or uh, capitalize on on the current products in the future. Confidentiality, stay silent, don't don't speak about this. This is very important in the in the in the case of uh, patents because uh, a patent must not be public uh, on on the day of application uh, when you file it with uh, the patent and registrationsverket or some uh, some more international uh, uh, institution. Trade secrets are regulated by law, affärshemligheter in Swedish. Uh, this is basically everything that uh, shouldn't be disclosed to the public that you're working with. S and then also the patents which are protected by uh, filing and registration. Um, the main rule is that the ownership of the internet intellectual property rests with the creator. So this could be a founder, it could be an employee, uh, it could be a consultant or y users uh, where you have uh, user created content, for example, and or others. Uh, you can en enter into agreements with these, uh, stating that anything that the employee does within uh, his employment, his or her employment, uh, shall belong to the company. And same goes for a consultant. That's that's very common. Uh, that uh, I mean, you're not doing this for your personal gain. You're doing it for the sake of the company to s succeed. Um, and this is what I just mentioned. You can transfer the ownership of the intellectual property to your company through an IP assignment or uh, stating it in the employment agreement. That's also very common. Uh, or the consultancy agreement. Uh, if, you, if we look at the user, you can have it in the terms of, uh, terms of use. So saying that if you have a you're offering a create some kind of website for creating works of art. Uh, if you, that could be 
uh, tied to uh, terms of use, where uh, anything you create on the website belongs to the provider of the website instead of yourself. So this is important to document, uh, otherwise it will be, in a case of a dispute, very hard to prove who has the right to the intellectual property. And as mentioned, if 70% of the current stock value is it consists of uh, intellectual property, uh, then you can just imagine which values we are talking about here. If someone creates something and it's not clear uh, who, who owns it. So here are some things to consider in relation to the, the transfer of property, uh, intellectual property. Uh, comes to copyright. Uh, yes, a question. Yeah, I, let's see. I have a question. So, if I create a web page offering or something via, for instance, Wix, could Wix become the owner of my intellectual property? If you s like a sales portal, or s yeah, for instance, or. Uh, a new way or a, a marketplace for selling, but that it wouldn't be trademarked a marketplace. Um, I'm just thinking, I mean, could you could there be an instance where you use someone else's platform and therefore they, all of a sudden, can be part owners too? Yes, if you have agreed to it. So read the terms and conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, you just click them and then forget about it. Huh. But. Uh, I mean, if, if that's the case, it's such an important thing. They, they, they should be obliged to inform you, not mm -hmm. only with the terms and conditions, yeah. because uh, the, I mean, uh, there should be some kind of stronger agreement, I would mm. say. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, the moral rights is that, uh, for example, if you, you know, uh, you go you go online and you and you want a picture of an apple, so you Google Apple and then you download it and you don't think about it. But however, there is a creator behind that, and uh, you can actually not transfer your moral right. So you need to state if you're going to stick to the book, you need to state for every single picture who took this picture, uh, and so on. Uh, same thing when you post on social media. Uh, you, you do actually have to s state who took the picture, who painted it, who who is the creator of this. And if not, if you don't know, then you can uh, make a reservation or a disclaimer. Uh, please send a DM for cred. Then you have somewhat uh, uh, healed the damage or the burden. Um, so, uh, here is a difference between company name and domain name. The AB is limited to Sweden, Aksjeblog. This is to designate a legal entity, so it's, it's not an intellectual property as such. However, it could be, going back to your question, uh, could the, the company name and the product name be a trademark? The .com or .se or .nu or whatever you use uh, is an ad address only, so there's no legal protection. However, uh, you can claim a domain name. Say that you have registered McDonald's.nu. If I mean, that's more relevant for McDonald's to have, so they need to go to uh, the the d dispute uh, institution for domain names uh, and claim it and perhaps also pay you uh, a sum of money to transfer it to McDonald's. And the registered trademark uh, symbol, the R, is an indication of origins of goods, services. This gives you a right to prohibit the use uh, for others. Uh, here are some criteria for trademark registration. It must be able to function as a trademark. Uh, so you can't register coffee as a trademark or 
uh, bicycle. It, it must have something which is distinct uh, and uh, yeah, identifiable. Um, and it must not be identical or similar to earlier rights. So again, it needs to be distinct. Go to 10 would be that. I mean, there's not uh, other companies or institutions that are called go to 10. So that's uh, could be registered as a trademark. Perhaps it is also. And uh, it must not infringe other trademarks. So if there's a law firm which wants to be named Sync, spelled otherwise uh, or identical, that would never work. However, if you were to open a cafe uh, called Sync, that's fine, because we're in different fields of business. Uh, there were tr three different systems. One is an yes, is a question. Um, so, uh, if you have an event company and a bar opens up, mm. or a cafe that has the same name as our event company, is that completely different? Mm. Then no, because they they would be within the same area, most probably. Okay. Yeah. So then, if we are, uh, if our name is trademarked, or so we mm. can claim that they are not allowed to have the same name. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't even need to be trademarked because it can be, <laughs> I don't know the English word, but inabetat. So it's commonly known. Uh, say that Coca-Cola is not a trademark. Uh, it is. But if it wasn't, <laughs> then it's so well known for everyone in our basically everyone, that no one else could use it. So after a while, but then if, then you also need to prove as a, as a trademark holder as a, or as a name holder that this is the case. So you need to show uh, perhaps by doing uh, market uh, like you, you ask the market, and then and then you gain material for that. That yes, 82% of the Swedish population know about this company. Then you could claim that this is uh, well known, and thereby uh, obtaining protection. So, in this, in if they would do that in this case, for instance, would it have to be well known in Sweden, or can it be like within the IT sector in Malmo? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's also a relevant question because of what is the relevant market uh, for Apple? It would be global uh, f for uh, buses IT hörna in Malmo. <laughs> Maybe that's more relevant. So if uh, if Bus uh, in uh, Lean Shopping wants to open a company, then could be that it would be allowed, depending on the market. But if you would start a private uh, train company and call it SJ, that would never work. Uh, so you can register nationally in Sweden is patent and registreringsverket. Uh, so then it would be protected in Sweden. You can also make an EU registration. So it would your trademark would be protected within the whole of EU. And then you have the international registration. However, that doesn't make the trademark global uh, because you need to pick the different areas and the, the countries where they are supposed to be registered. It's quite costly, both in terms of fees and also uh, for consultants, uh, law firms or patent, uh, uh, IPR uh, companies and such uh, consultants that help with this. But it's quite tricky to get it right, so that's why. And again, it's a lot of values involved, a lot of value. So it might be worth it. Okay, your favorite uh, subject, uh, personal data. <laughs> uh, this is uh, something that we do a lot. Uh, also, 
by using MyGon services that I mentioned before, uh, where we have uh, automatic uh, agreement review. Uh, this is also the, the currency of today's di digital economy. I'm sure you've heard that, that you, what you're selling, nothing comes for free. You're trading it for your personal data. And some companies, it might seem that they are doing something, but what they are doing is collecting a lot of personal data in order to organize that or transfer it and sell it to others. Uh, data is the new oil is a similar uh, statement. Um, it's, it's also worth a lot. So data and intellectual property, I mean, that's, that's what we, those are the most valuable things we have today. Which is interesting because it's, I shouldn't say it's air, but it's, uh, it's, it's I mean, it's, mm, it's, you can't pick it up and carry it away. Uh, however, data and intellectual property can travel all around the world within seconds today. So uh, this is what happened before the GDPR uh, entered into force, or not happened, but this is the cus consumer's perspective. So 82% uh, of, of uh, consumers said that they plan to take advantage of their new rights to see or limit or erase their data. I don't know, has anyone done that here? No. Uh, but th that was the view. And 93% of consumers said that they would erase their data if they weren't comfortable with the use. Um, and when it comes to handling of personal data, um, the trust is not very high. 68% don't trust uh, how the companies handle the personal data. And also, for your own benefit, you don't want to uh, share your personal data. What I do now is that uh, comes to cookies, for example. Uh, I, I, now, I now decline all the cookies uh, because I don't, I don't want to have marketing for a pair of shoes that I've already bought. <laughs> and I don't want, I don't want the, the companies to know where I live, for example. So uh, I used to be naive, but now I've narrowed my scope there because uh, I don't want to sell myself in the terms of data. Uh, basically, anything could be personal data. Your name, where you live, uh, your where I am, am now. I mean, my iPhone has uh, the hit the iPhone function, so Apple could probably locate me standing at go to ten. Uh, all the online identifiers, um, bank ID and such. My health is personal data. That's very sensitive information, of course. Uh, I don't want anyone to have access to my uh, medical journals except for my, my doctor. My income is personal data. Uh, I'm sh perhaps you've heard about Ratsit and such services where you can see what your neighbor has in salary. Uh, however, they don't rely on the GDPR. They rely on the freedom of uh, uh, speech, Yttrandefrihetslagen. Uh, uh, so what you, what you get is a page from the catalog stating not only my income, but anyone else who has the name uh, close to Johan Ragnar. So that's, that's why they can do that. And more. I mean, an email address. Johan.ragnar at sync.law. Uh, there's not many of us uh, who has that name. So that's attributable to me as a person. So then it becomes personal data. And the GDPR uh, I mean, it's not only burdensome, it's also a unique opportunity to build competitive advantage. So, speaking again of these companies, uh, having data as uh, an, an, an asset. Um, it's been around now for nearly four years. I mean, it feels like it was just yesterday that it launched, but uh, 
it has uh, meant a lot uh, and a lot of work for us as lawyers as well. Uh, and the purpose was to give the citizens back control of our data. Also to uh, simplify the regulatory environment for businesses because unregulated uh, field means a lot of confusion. So regulation is good in that way. And also keep up with the technical development, of course, because when the former directive of 1995 was uh, implemented, the digital landscape was completely different. I mean, in 1995, that's when I started using the internet. Uh, or actually, 96, that's when I got my Hotmail address, <laughs> which is not in use anymore. <laughs> Uh, or actually I use it when I don't want anything from it. If I'm, I'm about to register somewhere, I can use my Hotmail and never look at it. Um, so there's based on, on previous principles, but there are of course new stricture provisions uh, and introduces new obligations. Some key words here is uh, of course personal data, uh, the processing, where you process data, which is very wide definition. When do you process data? The data subject, that would be me or you. And the controller would be the company, uh, usually a company, could be an individual as well, uh, that determines the purpose uh, and means of how to process the personal data. And you have the processor and the sub-processor. So all these are involved. And this is what it looks like from a legal perspective. You have the data subject uh, and the data controller. Uh, these are regulated, uh, or your, your data is regulated by the privacy policy. That's the one that you, you tick but never read on all websites. And the data controller uh, would be an online merchant, say Salando, or uh, go to 10 when you register over here on the computer and enter your name and your email in order to get access to this area. Then go to 10 would be the data controller. Then you have a data processor, say a cloud service provider such as uh, AWS or uh, Google, which processes the data on behalf of the data controller. So you need to enter into a data processing agreement, a DPA. These agreements can also be analyzed through MyGon's services, or we can look at them manually, of course. Then you can also have a sub-processor, a data center located in Lulio, which processes the data on behalf of the data processor. Uh, here are the business risks which you have under the GDPR. There are administrative fines. Uh, perhaps you've read in media uh, extremely high fi fines for such companies as Google and Facebook for not complying with the personal data. And it can become so uh, high because it's based on the turnover of the company. So the more they have in turnover, the more are the fines. You can also ha have audits, uh, Integritetsskyddsmyndigheten, which was previously called Data Inspektionen, can come and have a, an audit uh, of your company. That could be quite costly. And of course, perhaps the last one, negative publicity and bad will. It could actually inflate your whole company if it comes to the knowledge that uh, that uh, you have not treated the, the, the data correctly. So this is, all of this is if someone notices that you haven't done it or like you aren't handling it properly. What happens if you have a leak in some way for some reason uh, that there mm -hmm. is a breach? Uh, I recently saw this webpage uh, 
haveibeenpawned.com. And you can see all of the times that your data has been leaked <laughs> by any web page. Yeah. Uh, and LinkedIn, for instance, leaked my password and a mm -hmm. bunch of things. A then, of years ago. then as a company, you have not fulfilled your duty to have technical measures that are good enough. So you can't be lazy with that. You can't blame it on, I mean, oh, we didn't know. The mm -hmm. data leaked. So. And who is leaked. it that sues them for like uh, for this? Can you as an individual, when you see that, oh, they, they leaked my password, can you sue them? Uh, yes, but it, it would more probable would be that Integritet with its Mündigheten would take measures. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But you need to you need to prove if if you and, a, and an individual are about to sue them, you need to prove the damage. Where is the damage? I mean, if my data is just lost somewhere, uh, what what has it caused me? Well, basically, nothing. But if it has been leaked to uh, s someone committing a fraud, and you uh, and because of the leaked data, they enter into your bank account and empty it then you have, then there's a damage. But then the question is, whose responsibility is it? I know, like, us at the Swedish Internet Foundation, we promote that people, for instance, should have different passwords on different pages. Mm. But let's say that your password on LinkedIn is the same as somewhere you have, where you have your card, mm. uh, and you're now scammed on a bunch of money because of the LinkedIn. Is it LinkedIn? It, that is that also LinkedIn's fault, mm. or is it your fault that you have the no, same password? <laughs> <laughs> Difficult question, but it 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 could be. I mean, usually in the terms, at least when we write them, uh, we state that uh, like how should you formulate your password? And as here in, on Go to Ten, I noticed when I logged in, you need to have, which is quite common now, letters numbers and a special uh, sign, character, yeah. Uh, which actually <laughs> doesn't prevent me from having the exact same pa password on Facebook and LinkedIn or a merchant site or wherever. But, uh, and in the case of a bank, uh, passwords are not good enough because now you have, you need to have the strong customer author author authorization the SCA, which is, uh, has been implemented as a result of the GDPR. So you need to have a combination of two elements, a hardware and a code, a uh, bank ID and a code, uh, a software and something else. So you can't really have uh, just a password to enter into these more important websites. And bank ID is becoming more and more common, uh, not only for financial services, but for everything that is more sensitive. That's a business ID. Launch an uh, email account, which you need to um, access through bank ID. Um, then just my last thing is about incentive programs, because this is uh, good to have. Uh, it's a good way of um, offering some kind of financial incentive instead of salary. That's usually why I use this, because as a, as a startup, you don't have much liquidity, not, not that much money, but uh, you might have a developer or uh, a board member or someone else that believes in your company so that in the future it will generate money, uh, it will be valuable. And then you have your warrants or stock options which uh, could, if the company goes well, gen generate a kickback in the future. And there's a number of different uh, options here, uh, option options. You have the warrants which are valued as a fair market value. Uh, this will uh, cause a capital gain tax when they're uh, when uh, when they are converted into shares, uh, they are considered as a securities, which is a quite complex regulation. 
they're also freely transferable, so I can sell my warrants to anyone, usually. And ju that's because they're loosely tied to the employment. So it's, uh, this is quite common in, uh, in larger companies that need, want to have an incentive program for their employees. So the better uh, the, the company performs, the, the value of the warrant and eventually the shares will increase. Then you have employee stock options. You pay no consideration, you get it for free. Um, however, there's an income tax and social security contributions, Arbetsgivar avgift, because it's seen as a replacement for salary. So that's how you can like think about this. It's done through an agreement. You're not allowed to freely transfer it to anyone else, and it's also closely tied to the employment. And the same goes for qualified employee stock options. I'm going to move on to the uh, next slide here, because uh, there are certain conditions that need to be fulfilled. They have recently changed, so now it's more liberal. Uh, this is... Uh, a regulated kind of option um, in order to increase uh, innovation and the company must not have more than 150 employees it used to be lower I think it was 50 uh, the turnover must not be more than 280 million and the business must be younger than 10 years and not be subject to company reorganization. So, um, I mean, when the company is in financial trouble. And when the option is acquired by the employee, um, the shares must not be owned by more than 25, uh, by 25% or more of a public entity. Uh, it must not be traded and the value of the options may not exceed 3 million kroner. Also, perhaps the most important criteria here is that the op option holder shall be employed for a minimum of 30 hours a week. So uh, you can't just distribute it to any consultant or anyone who is just working for five hours a week or so. Okay, so this was a snapshot of uh, the legal issues that my, might occur in uh, your startup or your, your company. And uh, I'm opening up. We have received some questions from the audience. Uh, if you have any questions now left, you can ask them now. Or I will be uh, sitting over there after I've had my lunch. Uh, and have a, uh, the pop-up office talk to a lawyer for free. I can't give specific advice and when it comes to counterparties and I mean agreements and such, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any general questions about business law. And of course, you can also contact me uh, on LinkedIn or through the email address stated over here. Thank you very much.